Hello and welcome to this ICMI 20 interview of Dr. Rebecca Owens with me, William Collins and Mike Buchanan. Rebecca, or Becky, is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Sunderland with an academic background in psychology and evolutionary psychology. She is a chartered member of the British Psychological Society and a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Her research interests include the different mating behaviours of the sexes, body image and identity, and of particular interest to our likely audience, male psychology. Becky is a member of the male psychology section of the British Psychological Society. She co-authored a chapter within the Polgrave Handbook of Male Psychology on the subject of testosterone, and this year she started what I believe is the first university course on male psychology in the UK. So Becky, welcome. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Can I kick off the questions then with a question about evolutionary psychology? Yes. And why is it that so many people and bright people as well um, seem to be so skeptical of evolutionary psychology? I think um, people struggle to understand the concept of evolutionary psychology, really. And they, I, I think people feel that it's a lot about genetic determinism, which it's not. Um, and I think a lot of people also think it seems really far removed. Um, but what I, I suggest to people is that, you know, you, you see physical, physically how we have evolved. Why would our psychology be any different? Um, so a lot of the kind of pushback about evolutionary psychology, I don't really understand where it comes from, to be honest. I think it's a lot of misunderstanding. And a lot of, you know, I guess historically, um, religious pushback as well. People didn't want to think about anything other than a creationist perspective. And also people didn't want to think of us as being animals, but of course we are animals. So we're not, we're no different from any other animals in that sense that we're, we're um, subject to evolutionary processes. <laughs> I wonder if, if, sorry, Rick, were you about to say something? No, you carry on, Mike. Um, yes, I want, um, this, is, this is something that fascinates me. Um, I, I'm a big admirer of um, Steven Pinker, the Harvard psychology professor, and um, his book, The Blank Slate, was absolutely fascinating. Um, but of course, I mean, f feminist to, 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 to this day, I mean, they, 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 they tend not to push the blank slate theory so explicitly. Mm -hmm. But they will say um, that uh, plasticity makes up for for any differences in the brain, and um, th th there's there's um, a Dutch neuroscientist uh, who goes by the slightly unfortunate name of Dick Swab. Uh, <laughs> I've heard of him, <laughs> and, and he says there are is either hundreds or thousands of known differences between gender typical male and female brains. Um, so whenever you raise th th this issue of, of male and female brains um, with a feminist, they will emit, they have a go-to book. They always feminists have a go-to book for everything, and, and this uh, and there's there's two or three in this case. One of them is Cordelia Fine's Delusions of Gender. Oh yes. And I read a book recently, uh, a Human Diversity by Professor Charles Murray, um, and he says people working in the field um, of, of, of neuroscience laugh at Cordelia Fine. Mm -hmm. she, she, she's basically saying that, that yes there are differences but they don't matter because the human brain is so plastic that it's, it's non you know so I wonder if you have, have any thoughts on if you like male and female gender typical brains um I mean I think I think that men and women have um undergone different evolutionary processes and un undergone different evolutionary selection pressures throughout throughout our revolutionary history um just from a physiological perspective, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a biological or neuroscientist or anything like that. So my colleague, I think would say that, you know, if you looked physiologically, there aren't any real differences in our brain, but there are some small differences, but I feel like that just says everything there is about sex differences, really. There are an awful lot of similarities between men and women. But there are differences, and even if they are small differences, they they are very meaningful, mm. and they have big 
um, repercussions, I guess. They, they have big consequences for differences. So I think combined with our evolutionary history and sex differences in that sense, and of course, you know, reproductively speaking, we're, we're different as well. And that has an, you know, an, an, a relationship with our psychology as well. Um, I think we've got to take into account those differences. And yes, neuroplasticity is a thing. I don't think it can explain all of the differences. I don't think it can just wipe wipe those things out at all. No, we, we have some, something that Rick will be very aware of is what's called, I think it's called the Swedish paradox. And basically it's the phenomenon where the more gender equal the society and the more choice that women have in, in their choices of professions um, or, or, or choice not to work, the, 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 more they, the, the more they will go into gender typical fields. Yeah. So, so, it, so, really so, 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 it, you know, in Iran, you'll have plenty of female physicists, and in Sweden, very, very few. And and it's, mm -hmm. and, and feminists call that a paradox. I mean, to any men's rights activist, it's not a paradox. It's, it's blindingly obvious. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. Yeah. Can I change the, the, the subject just slightly? Although maybe it isn't really changing the subject. The the the, the male section of the um, British Psychological Society is is very new. It's only what two years old now, something yes. like that. Mm -hmm. And it had a rocky ride, didn't it, to being really approved? Did. I think that the first time, if I remember correctly, although there was a majority in favour, they then moved the goalpost and said, "Oh no, fifty percent isn't enough. You need something else, seventy percent or something." That's right. So there the seemed to be. I was getting the impression, uh, as an outsider, mind you, but I got the impression. There was quite a lot of pushback against it from within the BPS. Why? Why do you think that is? Well, I don't know if it did actually come from within the BPS or not. But I was thinking about this, and I thought the BPS is comprised of other psychologists and academics working in the field, and we see a lot of pushback against male psychology within our profession anyway. So if it did come from within the BPS, I think that probably isn't surprising um, because a lot of people do oppose it within the BPS and without the BPS um, mm. for reasons that I, I don't agree with, obviously, but everyone's different, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but is it an academically based objection or something else? I don't think it is an academically based objection, to be honest, um, because I think it's only equitable to have a male psychology section of the BPS. Um, mm. And I don't understand why anybody would logically oppose it for anything other than ideological concerns, really. Mm. Um, I mean, if anyone wanted to try and you know, argue against that or explain why that's not the case, then I'd be interested to hear that but I don't understand any academic perspective on why we wouldn't have a male psychology section. Yeah that, that's the worrying thing really that it's mm -hmm. uh, an example of ideology or politics trumping yeah. trumping the academic within the academic arena which is which is not good is it? No it's not at all um, mm. no. Uh, can, can I say that there's also of course a sex, sex issue here in mm -hmm. that um, uh, I have a female relative who got a doctorate in psych in, um, in psychology, gosh, 15 years ago, I think. Um, and well over 90% of her year's intake um, of, of students and, well, and, and, late, uh, and le later, you know, uh, graduates and so on, were, were, were female. It, it, it seems to be a very female-dominated field. Yeah. And amaz is. amazingly, there are no government initiatives to increase the number of male psychologists. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's very surprising. Um, Whereas if you look at engineering, exactly the opposite. I mean, yeah. the government throws tens of millions of pounds at that. So, so yeah. is, is it simply, um, if you like, uh, in, yeah. in, in part? If I can interrupt at that point, of course, it's not just the government. It's also the professional bodies. Because yeah. being an engineer, I know the, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, for mm. example, and the Institute of Physics have both been very vociferous and active for not years, but decades in promoting women in physics and engineering. Whereas what we have in psychology, as we just illustrated by the discussion of the BPS and uh, the rocky road to getting a male section. So it's not just government, it's also from within the, the professional bodies themselves, distressing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so is it? Uh, uh, sorry, Becky, I'm not sure I asked the question there, but I, I, <laughs> I, I guess what I'm coming to is, um, is this in part um, a, a manifestation of female narcissism that, that that women tend to be interested in in women's issues and what affects women, and they really, you know, are not interested in 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 you know, despite being psychologists, they are naturally less interested in men in men and men's issues. <laughs> It's, it's an interesting um, perspective on it. I think for a lot of people, it comes from the, the historical place of um, female oppression and this kind of almost aggressive pushback against that. And I, I can understand that to, a, to an extent. I mean, women have been oppressed historically, but some women have, but... <laughs> There's also a lot of men who have, and that's where I get stuck, that there's this fight from women who go, women have been historically repressed, they are, you know, throughout history, and it's like, well, not all women have, and likewise, not all men have done the oppressing. Some women have oppressed, some men have oppressed. I don't think it's a gender issue, is where I'm trying to get at. I don't think that that is a gender issue, but I think that that kind of misperspective of it, this, that misunderstanding of it, fuels a lot of the the hate and the opposition and the pushback against male psychology and the pushing for looking at women and let's let's push women forward. This kind of misunderstanding of women being disadvantaged historically, whereas men have had you know the pick of their playing field, which again I'm, it's, that's not something I agree with. Um, but it's that, um, I guess, a superficial perspective that people don't necessarily question. They don't necessarily look underneath that perspective and go, "Well, what about all of these other men?" Who, you know, you're not you're not thinking about that in a in a kind of logical way. I'm getting off on a tangent there, aren't I? No, I'm to... Well, no, I think not. No, far from it. I think that's absolutely right. I think mm. it's a distorted view of history is what drives a lot of these opinions that they're just not soundly based. They're based on a on a mythological view of history. Yes. But we it strikes me that this issue that Mike's raised about the um the percentage the sex ratio in psychology, yes. which is very skewed to women, we know it that is. It's, it's apparent even at A level, by the way. I've just happened to, I've just been looking at the stats. So it's it's not just university. So it's probably something innate, uh, which is fair enough. Um but it strikes me there's an there's an interesting question here because you have just started this uh, male psychology course and I think yes. I think I'm right I think it's the first one in the UK it's maybe maybe the first one in the world I'm not it's, sure yeah but but what what's what sort of sex well what sort of numbers are you getting in that course and what's the sex ratio there is it still massively biased towards women it is yes and um, we've got about 40 students in that cohort um and it is still biased towards women, which again, perhaps isn't very surprising because our, every year group that we have, at undergraduate and postgraduate, it's all biased towards women. Um, mm. And that's something that we've, we've been looking at in our Athena Swan process, our Athena Swan self-assessment team. So the chair of our self-assessment team, for, just for psychology, the School of Psychology, um, she's really interested in trying to increase um, the, the visibility of psychology to men. Um, and the, we also have another colleague in engineering as well, and they were going to they were going to look at you know the differences in these kind of um, government initiatives that you were talking about before, about promoting women into STEM, and what about men into things like psychology? And we kind of tried to do a lot of research about why this sex difference might come about, um, and we thought some of it it seemed to be that some of it women didn't seem to really understand that psychology is a science. Um, and that we do have to do a lot of numbers and um, oh, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> so we still have to do a lot of, of that stuff. And I mean, you know, there are some aspects of psychology that don't work with numbers, obviously, but there's still that rigorous process there that you, you've got to stick to. And and from a male perspective, a lot of men did, don't aren't, well aren't aware that that is the case. And the men that came that, that do come into the courses say that usually that they really enjoy that aspect of it and that they yeah. weren't aware just how quite rigorous it was going to be. And then a lot of the women say, I didn't realise that it was going to be like this and it really put us off. So <laughs> yeah. there's something there about <laughs> it. 
<laughs> I didn't realise I was going to have to understand the Man Whitney U test and the Cronbach Alpha and all that. Yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. Didn't realise we would have to do that by yeah. hand or anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there does seem to be that split, doesn't there, between the people that think it's always oh, just about people and it's all warm and cuddly and, and, yeah. and fluffy, yeah. and fluffy. Sitting around and, the, and, the, and the, the hardline yeah. empiricists that say, "Give me the data. <laughs> what's, yes, exactly. what's the significance?" <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, the the paper that you wrote with John Barry uh, oh, in yes. the Palgrave Handbook um, on testosterone was very interesting. I reread it again yesterday, and so testosterone is one of those subjects which is almost universally misunderstood, isn't it? So oh, here's yeah. me here's me question: Does testosterone increase aggression or dominance or status seeking? Uh, and are these things in any case good or bad? In in men, it increases um, dominance striving, I guess. And I don't think I don't think that that can be seen as good or bad because I think it's real context dependent. So in that chapter, I talk about the mouse model and how yes, status seeking, dominance striving probably does look aggressive in other species, but in humans, obviously, we're a lot more complex. And there are different ways of um, establishing dominance. And one of the best ways I think that we see this is in terms of it's not, you know, it's all it's not just a bad thing kind of thing, is competitive altruism mm. um, and striving to be the best cooperator. Um, so I don't I don't think we can say that it's you know, it's just aggressive and it's fighting and it's violence and it's putting yourself up at the expense of everybody else. I, I, that's too much of a simplistic, misunderstood view. Um, it's it's about um, putting yourself in the best position you can, not necessarily at the expense of other people, because cooperating has always been important in human evolutionary history, and it still is. It's not just... Um, it's not a selfish, aggressive thing. And we will see examples of this where people will compete to be the best cooperator, for example. Yeah, well, getting on in large organisations is, is sort of an example of that. It's a mixture okay. of selfish competition and satisfying the corporation as a whole. So it's, yeah. it's a mixture of the two things. And it, 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 would you agree with... Um, with me if I suggested that this aspect of men which is particular to men because it's encouraged by testosterone to be competitive and hierarchical because competition and striving generates hierarchy and mm -hmm. hierarchy is just really another name for inequality isn't it this mm -hmm. is what brings the masculine into apparent conflict with those who put all priority on equality at all costs that's a really good point I think that's a really interesting point um and like I said that's it's not the only reason why but I I don't agree with outcome and um, equality of outcomes for this reason really um because you see you know you can have a quality of opportunity and it results in all a, a, a hierarchy in some places but I just think it doesn't have to be a moralistic hierarchy. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to say that this puts anybody moralistically above or below anybody else. It just is. It's just, these things just are. And I, I don't understand why people aren't okay with that, I guess. Mm. I, I always think it would help if we had a more predictive quantitative theory of sociology so that we could examine in some way objectively the effect of these things because it seems to me I mean the, the obvious example is like in, in in communist regimes where they try and enforce rigorous equality all that happens is they level everyone down because you can't make everyone rich but you can make everyone poor you can't make everyone brilliant but you can't make everyone stupid exactly and and and, and so by eliminating hierarchy and competition or capitalism or whatever mm -hmm. um you sort of also eliminate drive and, and there's a direct parallel of this in physics because in mm -hmm. physics everything is is generated by potential difference 
difference yes. you know because it's that di potential difference is force which creates motion and makes everything happen and if every if potential was uniform nothing would happen it would be status and status and death and it seems to me there's probably an equivalent to that in sociology if somebody could actually put their finger on it that's it i mean a couple of interesting things popped into me head there listening to you talk and the first one was about stephen pinker um saying you know in his opposition of the blanks um the blank slate theory of human development blank slates don't do anything but human babies are equipped to develop to learn and we have these um kind of sensitive periods in which we will learn certain things much quicker than we will at certain other points in our lives like you know um, a sensitive period for language development for example where that will bloom so that there's those difference there's something there that that mm. kind of catalysts our development and our learning um what was the other thing that just popped into my head i can't even oh um about cooperation um so you know if we if we had a, a truly equal, equal society where everybody was equal and everybody um cooperated and helped out and and everything like that as, as you see in communist um, societies, that is rife for taken down. It takes for just a minority of people to come in and just take that down um, and exploit everybody's cooperation and altruism. And it doesn't, that's why it's not um, sustainable in a society. Yeah, yeah. We can't maintain that. Yeah, in game, um, in game theory terms, it's the- uh, yeah. The, the reneger, the person who reneges on a um, on a cooperative system can yes. benefit personally. And so it's always unstable and exactly. you stabilize it by making sure there are sanctions against people who renege that are sufficiently exactly. strong, which is norm so, normal, normally instigated through social shaming and, and guilt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, even from from an evolutionary perspective, you can see how um you know, co um, defecting rather than cooperating can be attractive an attractive um, strategy for some people. But at a society level, it, it just doesn't work for no. reasons you've just said very nicely and articulately. <laughs> yeah, the, the let's just get back to testosterone because there's some there's some more interesting stuff on that. Um, one of the things I've heard about, I don't know if there's sound data to back it up, is that men's testosterone levels tend to fall after a child is born. Is that true? And if so, why do you think that is? Yes, there is evidence that suggests that um, testosterone levels decrease in men once they are partnered and then furthermore, once they become fathers. Um, and the suggestion is that that is to help you know, to reduce the kind of dominance seeking motives in men so that they'll invest in their children because there's a there's a real strong evolutionary pressure on human men to um, invest in their children because we're horrible children, really, really costly. We need a lot of investment. Um, so to, to try and get the men to stick around and, and invest in their children, really. So they've got this hormonal... Um, correlate I guess of well it's been called a physiological correlate of mate and effort and um, testosterone will be higher to help um, motivate mating behaviors and it reduces to help motivate paternal behaviors and provisioning behaviors yeah 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 I mean it makes sense from the evo psych point of view doesn't it but yeah as as most things tend to but it's <laughs> mysteriously people still look at it as guns yeah so here's a, here's a, here's a um a hypothetical question for you then uh le leaving aside purely physical medical issues mm. if there was a sudden dramatic decrease in men's testosterone levels overnight all men what well, what do you think would happen in sort of psychology socio That's really interesting. Um, I think that there would be um, a worldwide lack of motivation to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I think things wouldn't yeah. be pushed. Things would yeah. just be maintained. Nothing would be pushed out of the comfort zone. Nothing would, you know, nothing truly creative or beautiful would be made. Everything would just tick along quite nicely and boring. <laughs> 
is what I yeah. think. Yeah, that what what do they call it? The not the Ig Nobel Prize, the other one where they give a prize for people who do really really stupid things. It would become dramatically <laughs> short of candidates, wouldn't it? And yes. and all those people that do base jumping and 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 jump yeah. off cliffs in wingsuits and all that, there wouldn't be so many of them anymore. No, there wouldn't. There wouldn't. <laughs> No, the, I, I, I must be lacking in testosterone because I've never felt tempted to do any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron, Aaron Pitts, he has a really good way of expressing that if, if testosterone was, you know, masculinity was really suppressed. You said we'd, we'd all drown in oestrogen soup. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> was it, Rick, can I ask, was it Camille Paglia who said that if women had been in charge of civilization? We'd all still be living in caves, but the cushions would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> oh, mind you, mind you, it'd be gay men doing the cushions. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, just before I come on to on to my next question, Becky, I'd just like to bring up. Um, I, I, I've long had an interest in uh, intersex competition, mm -hmm. um, and the, the, there's there's a theory which drives feminism up the wall. And it's called preference theory, and it was published um, in a book in uh, the year 2000 by Dr. Catherine Hakim, a world-renowned sociologist. And she she um, she, she researched um, men and women men and women's orientation in a number of countries to work, um, and to, you know if, if you like how work-centered they were, and 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 she basically found that four in seven British men were work-centered. And only one in seven British women mm. is work centered. So that, you know, in terms of equality, I mean, you would expect an 80 20 split on, let's say, major corporate boards, mm -hmm. just down to work ethic. And if you had other, yeah. if you had other issues, um, it would be near a 90. Um, mm. um, but um, so, so my own conference speech is about how and why, decade after decade, women fail to compete successfully with men at the highest levels if the playing field is level. This being the case, initiatives to deliver equality of outcome, such as Athena Swan, inevitably lead to a decline in organizational performance and invariably at a higher cost too. Yeah. Uh, what is wrong with women that they seek equality of outcomes regardless of merit? And why do you think men capitulate to these demands, which in the case of Athena Swan, must be denying many men academic careers? I think, um that comes back partly again to the to the misunderstood kind of historical narrative and this misunderstanding of women being historically repressed and trying to regain their status and or, or tr yeah trying to regain their perce perceived to be lost status and lost opportunities and things like that um but as you say i I don't I don't agree that we could level the playing field and and it does concern me that um, for men and women, that if we tried to level the playing field, that, that we would be pushing people into something that wasn't suitable for them, whether that's just because they didn't want to or, you know. So as, as you're saying there about the 80-20 split, I was just talking to, to my students about the male variability hypothesis. Mm. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. I presume you are. <laughs> I'm very familiar with everything. Um, <laughs> Not quite. So this... <laughs> The, the idea, you know, that if we looked at a normal distribution, there's more men at the top and at the bottom end of the spectrum. And women tend to cluster much more around the mean. And this is in line with sexual selection um, perspectives as well. So on that caveat that we would expect to see more men at that top end of the tail, you know, maybe it's the 80-20 split that you talk about, but that, that we wouldn't exclude that 20% of women who would be up there as well. And that's where this equality of opportunity comes from. And so trying to push people into, into anything just to make it a 50-50 split. And, and like I said, I said to our chair of our um, Athena Swan self-assessment team that I couldn't, I couldn't be involved in our assessment if that was... Um, what our goal was because I wouldn't support something like that. So say, for example, if we had to make that a 50-50 gender split and then there was less capable women who replaced more capable men because of that, we would then have to go around and do the same everywhere. So, you know, are we going to start forcing 50% of women to enter the military and prevent some men who want to be in the military 
from being there just to make the make it an equal ratio are we going to stop putting men in prison just to make sure we've got women going into prison in a 50 50 split it doesn't stop just there if that... but, but, the but, but, but in practice it does stop there that's the problem yeah this, it's it's equality in one direction only yeah, it is, yeah but, exactly but, but the entire point of athena swan is to do exactly that isn't it and um so so i mean you know huge concern about the the proportion of women in engineering damn all interested in the proportion of men in psychology so it's yeah. it, it's the so so i mean there's a lot of funding going behind these things and I, my understanding is that um um re research grants um are, you know are, are denied to uh, maybe departments or individuals who are not who don't get the requisite number of stars so th there's a lot of pressure um, nice. you, know, uh, uh, you know aiming at this objective that we can all agree is utterly absurd yeah exactly there is um and i mean like i say i were athena swan we made recommendations about um trying to attract men into psychology um maybe that's a little easier for me for us to say because i'm, I'm in psychology i'm not in engineering or anything but um yeah we made we made recommendations about that yeah, that's good. I mean, just to put my cards on the table, I, I don't believe in forcing equality of outcome. And, and that means that I'm perfectly relaxed if psychology continues to be 80 percent women. I'm, it's not the same for the people who are psychologists that bothers me. It's the integrity of the subject that bothers me. And so I'm, I'm very glad you're putting on a male psychology course because the, the, the difference between engineering and psychology in fact the difference between the subjects that are dominated by men and those that are dominated by women is and this is an absolutely 100 percent correlation is that men go for the subjects which are to do with things mm -hmm. and women go for the subjects that are to do with people and animals it's yeah. a perfect split and so it's bloody clearly innate you don't need yeah. any more evidence than that um, but i'm perfectly relaxed about that but the, yeah. but it doesn't mean there's a skew in the likely, not the people, but the way the subjects are approached. Because gender is irrelevant to a lump of steel or an electron. Yes. But it's very relevant when you, your subject matter itself is people. Yeah. So the issue of uh, a potential gender bias is really only on the side in the, of the subjects which are dominated by women. And that that's the sort of source of the problem. Yeah, that's a good point. And it, so it's a very good thing you're putting on this male psychology course, Thank because, you. I mean, you know, we all come from our own psych psychological background. So I don't understand the psychology of women naturally. It has to be an academic or... <laughs> cerebral yeah. study and the, th the <laughs> same is very obviously true the other way around i mean if you're a man yeah. you do see that you are not understood by women. Oh, and, and don't, <laughs> you know I, I understand the the irony that i'm a woman and i'm putting on the male psychology um module definitely <laughs> yes but that that doesn't matter as long as you're aware of it because after all i'm not an electron it doesn't stop me studying electrons <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm not likely to make the mistake that I am one. <laughs> that's the that's, difference. That's a good point. Yes. <laughs> um, so, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, just staying on this. Um, it, it's absolutely inevitable that what comes out of the Athena Swan is that women are getting positions ahead of better qualified men. Now, 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 surely there must be huge resentment in academia at that reality. Is there not? I mean, are, are men not fume? I, I, I don't know what men can do. I mean, nothing, I guess. But, but they must well, be. That's it. I, that's it. I, there must be. And I, I do wonder about, um, you know, when people start, when you hear the statistics about, oh, well, we've got um, nearly a 50 50 split in male and female professors or something like that. And I just think, I don't want to see those statistics. It's, it's like you mentioned before. Um, I want I want to know about the integrity of that data. Are, is that comparable? Um, you know, or do we are we looking at something like three publications versus twenty publications? You know, something daft like that. I don't know. Um, are they comparable? Have are those women and those men getting those positions based on merit? Um, I'm not I'm not interested 
you know, from a personal perspective, what the gender ratio is, I'm interested in the integrity of that. And, and it all, for me, comes down to the equality of opportunity. And that's why, as he said before, I don't, I'm not bothered about the, the gender ratio in psychology being 80-20, as long as everyone knows that it, it is a subject that can appeal to men as well. And, you could, and it's not just a female-oriented subject. If, you, if you're interested in that, then great, come and study it. It's, it's making sure that everyone has that opportunity to be able to do that if they want to. And then, yeah, we are, we'll probably end up seeing what you see in Switzerland when when we you know take take those pressures off. Um but yeah, sorry I'm I'm going off on one now. <laughs> well a, a slightly a related question I suppose. Um your views are not exactly typical I would think of people in in the academy, particularly on the well, in psychology or the humanities generally, yeah. Um, do you do you find sympathetic voices there at Sunderland, or do you find your alone voice crying in the wilderness? There's a couple. There's a couple of sympathetic voices, but we are very quiet, I think. Yeah. Um, and there are people who um, are very loud and in opposition to it. Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting question in psychology in itself yeah. why is one side so loud which seems to reflect uh confidence in their opinion in some way and um yeah. others like you and i are tend to be a bit more reticent about expressing our opinions in public yeah i mean for me i always feel like i am I, I'm worried about saying the wrong thing and and offending somebody and that's i, I don't want to do that even you know, I don't want to upset anybody and say the wrong thing because terminology seems to change quite a bit. And then I get stuck on, well, it's just semantics. I don't, I'm not really bothered about what these labels are. I'm talking about what, what it is that's lying underneath it. But I also think, and this might sound really awful, but there's there's a bit of a Dunning-Kruger aspect sometimes as well. Um, and I think people who are less informed do typically um, shout an awful lot um, about things that they could probably be better informed about. And I don't want to be one of those people. <laughs> no, no, there is that as well, yeah. I mean, it, it, is a, it is a very difficult thing to fight, isn't it? And, it is. And uh, because the one thing you need is, is, is tolerance of other people's opinions in order to Absolutely. make progress. And that seems to be what's lacking. And to some extent, we play along with that by being reticent. Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, Mike isn't reticent in the least, I've <laughs> noticed. <laughs> but I confess I'm rather more reticent than he is. I, um, I, I, I was going to wear my Feminism is Cancer t-shirt, but I, <laughs> I thought that, uh, that might not go down well. Um, I, I wonder if I can ask a final question from me anyway. Um, um, the, the, I've, uh, we've already mentioned uh, Karen Strawn or Girl Writes What, the legendary... Uh, um, MRA and, um, and anti-feminist. Um, in, in our 2016 International Conference on, Conference on Men's Issues, she spoke on the topic of, uh, or her talk, talk title rather, was Toxic Femininity. Mm. Um, and it was a very good speech, like all her speeches are. Um, we, we, we hear a lot about toxic masculinity. Um, what, why, isn't, why, Becky, do you think femininity isn't under the spotlight the way that masculinity is? I think that that partly is um, misunderstanding of what masculinity is and what femininity is. Um, I feel like a lot of when we hear about toxic masculinity is just a bit of a misunderstanding about what masculinity actually is. And again, it might come into the historical perspective, this, this misunderstood historical narrative of female oppression and male oppression um, in terms of Men are the ones who have been oppressing. Masculinity is bad in that sense. Femininity must be good because it's been oppressed. Um, but I, I don't understand why that is the case either. I think there's a lot of aspects of femininity that could be considered to be toxic. I mean, personally, I don't think toxicity is something that's necessarily gendered, that's innately gendered. This, this perception of masculinity being toxic because it's ruthless and it's aggressive and things like that comes down back to the testosterone stuff that, you know, that's just a misunderstanding. Um, 
women can be toxic, very toxic, as we're all aware of. Yeah. And whether that's an aspect of femininity or whether it's just people. Um, right. I, I just like to point out something, something that agitates MRAs considerably is, is the public perception that in, in domestic violence, that, that, that men are overwhelmingly the perpetrators and women the victims. It's been known, I mean, there's a very good uh, section in uh, Rick's amazing book, uh, The Empathy Gap. He's too, he's too modest to plug it, so I will. Um, um, about um, a, a couple of major sort of, uh, you know, uh, studies. And the, 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 the basic stats are that in straight couples, about 60% of, of straight couples where there's domestic violence, um, it's mutual, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. a woman starts it, sometimes a man starts it. But in the 40% of the remainder where the violence is always one way, the perpetrator is twice as likely, twice as likely to be the woman as the man. Mm -hmm. And yet, we, you know, I've never, in, 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 in all the years I've been interested in, 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 in these areas, I've never seen, a, you know, you always see a poster, let's say on the BBC, yes. um, of, of a woman cowering in the corner and a man with a clenched fist or a baseball bat or something. Um, I, I, I don't think, I mean, we, 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 we managed to find one, um, one image of, of, a, of a battered man, mm -hmm. but, but um, for, for some reason society doesn't want to um, accept that women can be violent and are more yeah. violent towards their partners than, than men. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We, we've been looking at that in, in the male psychology module recently. And um, we had a guest lecture from Liz Bates as well. Mm. And we did we did that. We, we were looking to see, you know, if you if you Google domestic violence, what pictures do you see? And um, what support do you see? And, and things like that. And I think, I mean, it, it would be interesting to know, you know, what the stats would be a few hundred years ago. I presume we don't have that kind of data. But... I wonder if if this this narrative around female oppression has kind of given some women carte, carte blanche to to push back a, a bit more. Um, I do wonder about that that it, if if it's pushed it the other way. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I suspect that's always been there. But um, I, um, I, I use a photo library, an online photo library, and I put in the keywords uh, "male victims of domestic violence." 7,000 images came up, all of female. They, they didn't have a single um, image of a male victim. Anyway, so, so, so that, that was, uh, sorry, I, I rambled there a little bit as, as I told <laughs> you. Um, uh, um, sorry, we, we'll, edit, we'll edit this little bit out, but uh, I think all it's time right. for your final question. And then, and then I'll, after Becky's responded to that, then the outro, I think, Rick. Um, yeah, well, I think I'd like to just come back to the uh, and fi and finish on the the note of the your male psychology course because that's obviously a sort of major event um, that for you and for us. Uh, so, can I come back to that and just ask you what sort of subjects it covers? You've mentioned domestic violence there. What what yes. other issues does it cover? Um, well, we've covered um, biological sex differences and gender differences. Um, we've covered. Um, parental alienation, um, male victims of sexual abuse, child sexual exploitation, the awareness of those aspects. We've looked at, um, are we going to be looking at sex differences in, I wasn't really sure how to phrase it, but real world settings. So why men are more likely to be in the military. We looked at conscription as well. So we, we questioned the, the gendered narrative about um, about female oppression and male oppression to look at kind of forgotten men throughout history as well. Um, we've looked at sex differences in exposure to trauma and in responses to trauma and how that might impact male risk taking and substance abuse further down the line as well. And we've had some really nice guest sessions from John Barry and Martin Seeger um, and Kenny Mamarella de Cruz as well. So yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty comprehensive. Um, I mean, I'd probably think of one or two other things like um, the history of education is a good one because that's that be really widely good. misunderstood. You know, people tend to think women um, women were not educated and men were, which is another of the massive oversimplifications. Because yeah. actually, the vast majority of both sexes were not educated is exactly. the simple truth. Um, yeah, excellent. Sounds good. Thank you. I'll have to join. <laughs>
Uh, well, thank you, Becky, for your time. We're very grateful. It's been a fascinating uh, interview. We, we wish you the best of luck and uh, success with your new male psychology thank course. You. And uh, keep the, uh, the flag of truth and freedom flying over there. In <laughs> well done. Will do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Becky. That was wonderful. Thanks. And it's a wrap. <laughs>